Welcome. It's my privilege to spend this time with you uh, to discuss a very important topic of transformational leadership. Uh, many people around the world are saying that the crisis for transformational leadership in, in the uh, areas of justice is really at, at a, an, an, an urgent level. Who are the leaders that are going to recognize those systems of injustice that oppress so many? And who are going to stimulate a change, a charge among uh, common people? who want to make sure that, that justice and righteousness is available to all persons of, of all races and all nations and personalities. This Transformational Leadership Series will be consist of five programs uh, that you'll be able to see. Uh, in addition to that, there will be a workbook, uh, Speak Freedom, Developing Transformational Leaders, uh, that will be available online, and also a workbook that will share some of these same PowerPoints that we use during the series uh, so that you can do follow-up work and, and spend some time answering the questions that, that we suggest for you in this, in this series. Bob Goff, who was an adjunct professor uh, in the law school at Pepperdine in, in uh, California, asked a very unusual question. He asked the question, what lights your bulb? <laughs> Not only was that such an unusual question, but it was also the setting was, was, was very unusual. He was sitting in a conference room with a group of law students, and, and as they were seated around the table, he, he looked at them individually and, and asked, what, what lights your bulb? You know, what, what is it that, that really stimulates your passion? Uh, what are those things that, that really stir you up and make you want to make a difference in the world? Perhaps it was appropriate for him to ask that question there because the very ethos of Pepperdine Law School uh, is, is the idea to let the light shine, to let justice flow like a mighty stream. Uh, this is a biblical concept and the, the law school was built around that. Let the light shine, let justice flow like a mighty stream. Uh, how, do we, how do we help countries build a system that delivers justice for their people? Uh, we'll learn during this series uh, from examples of leaders like uh, Nelson Mandela, who led a, a movement of justice in South Africa, uh, helping to overthrow some of the oppressive systems there that, that uh, marginalized even a majority of the people who lived in that country. As we think about this question of, of what lights your bulb, he, he asked the students to reflect on that, and one of the students there was Angela. And, and she said, the thing that lights my bulb is the cause of justice. Uh, particularly, she was concerned about sex trafficking among young women. Uh, she founded the university chapter of International Justice Mi uh, Mission. And then she and the students there reached out to East Africa, uh, first in Uganda and then in Rwanda. Uh, this burden that she had for these, these women and men, uh, primarily children who were being trafficked around the world, uh, as, as sex toys are, are as instruments of pleasure, are sometimes as domestic slaves. She knew that was not right and knew someone had to do something about it. Well, she couldn't abolish it globally, but, but she could do her part. And so she stimulated the students here in the law school. They developed this IJM chapter. They began to travel to these places of great concern, like, like in Rwanda, and they began to make a difference. We think about this question of, of, of what is it that, that lights your bulb or that stirs up this passion within you. We're reminded of a scripture in, in, in the Old Testament, in the Bible, Micah 6, 8. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love mercy, and walk humbly with your God? One example is Susan Peters. Uh, Susan Peters is a member of the Antioch Community Church in, in, in the city where I live, uh, Waco, Texas. Uh, she established uh, what she began to call Unbound. Again, her passion and her burden was for those who were being trafficked, even in Texas, even in America. And so she began to reach out to these students and, and, and the, these, these children, and, and ultimately what was just an outreach of the church became uh, its, its own ministry called Unbound. Another example of a group of people that followed their passion was a, a church in the D.C. area, McLean Bible Church. Uh, in McLean Bible Church, uh, there was a, a family that experienced uh, the birth of a child with great disabilities. 
And unfortunately, tragically, the child didn't survive. Well, as a way to, uh, to deal with their own personal grief, uh, they founded a ministry called Jill's House. This is a ministry to families who have kids with disabilities. In, again, in my city where I live in, in Waco, Texas, uh, there was a young a couple who met at Baylor University. Uh, uh, they were uh, uh, Janet and, and Jimmy Durrell. After they married, they knew that God gave them a burden for the world. So far, six months, they traveled around the world in some of its neediest places. They began to look at what the needs were and, and wondering what God's plan was for their life. Well, as a result, they came back and they realized that God's calling was right where they were, Waco, Texas. They began to study about what were the needs of Waco, and, and they saw the problem of homelessness, and, and they also saw the, 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 the challenge of, 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 of those who uh, uh, were, were food insecure, didn't have food just to feed their own children. As a result, uh, they started what is called Mission Waco, and Mission Waco has, has sprung off into many different directions. Uh, My Brother's Keeper is one of the ministries that they do to help the homeless. They even started a church that they call Church Under the Bridge. Now, when you think of churches, you typically think of, in America, you think of uh, church buildings and cathedrals or, or, or places, houses of worship. Well, these homeless people, they didn't have a home to live in, and so neither did they have a church to attend. So, so Jimmy Durrell just began a church under a bridge, under a major overpass uh, there that goes through Waco, Texas. He began to gather and got some musicians together, and they began to sing. And, and Sunday after Sunday, they opened the Bible and they began to see what God has to say to them. Many of these who were living lives of hopelessness found hope in Jesus Christ. And they realized that God loves them and has a wonderful plan for their life. And so, so now for, for more than 20 years, the church under the bridge continues to reach out, not, not just to those who are homeless, but many of the professors from Baylor University started coming and, 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 and leaders in the community began to come. And, and so it was a bringing together of people that otherwise would have been marginalized or other people would have been in situ situations of leadership in the community. They began to know each other as individuals, as persons of worth and value. I had the privilege of being the pastor for Chuck Colson uh, when I was pastoring in the Washington, D.C. area. He is the founder of Prison Fellowship. Uh, you would never have imagined that Chuck Colson would be involved in something like Prison Fellowship. Uh, he was one of the most powerful men in our country. He was a special aide to, to at that time, President Nixon. Uh, he was, had always been able to accomplish any objective that he wanted by his own strength and his own determination. Well, if any of you know some of the story about America, uh, there was a horrible situation that, that, was, that we named Watergate. And that's when the president and some of his top aides abused their power. As a result, the president ended up resigning. And, and, and Chuck Colson was, was one of several who was put in prison. Before he went to prison, for the first time in his life, he realized he was facing a situation about which he had no control. He realized that it could not, his intellect couldn't get him out of this, his determination, and he began to see the darkness of his own heart. He cried out to a God that he had not called on before to reveal himself to Colson so that he might understand more fully what God's purpose was for his life. Uh, th there was a friend, uh, Tom Phillips, who was the CEO of Raytheon Corporation, who was a Christ follower. Colson went to him, emptied himself, and, 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 and Phillips began to share with him about how, how Christ had transformed his life. Well, Colson asked Jesus to do in his own heart what Jesus had done in the heart of, of, of his good friend. While he was in prison, he saw the condition of prisoners that were horrible, and he committed the rest of his life uh, trying to improve conditions for those in prison and trying to offer them the hope uh, that had escaped him so much when he was a prisoner. In America, the founders of our nation recognized the importance of faith. 
Uh, in the Articles of Confederation back in 1787, the Continental Congress wrote, religion, morality, and knowledge being necessary to good government and the happiness of mankind, schools and the means of education shall forever be encouraged. Even in, in our Declaration of Independence, uh, the very first uh, part of the, of, of the opening passage said, the promise of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So this American experiment that we have been involved in now for over 200 years was founded on the belief that, it do, that religion does make a difference. And that healthy religion, positive religion, brings about happiness and, uh, and self-fulfillment. Uh, there was a study that was done uh, by uh, Harvard's professor Robert Putnam and David Campbell, who, who summarized this in, in their book, American Grace. They said religious Americans are more generous with both their time and money, more trusting in their nature, more trustworthy and honest, and even measurably happier than their secular neighbors. Faith brings hope, and hope brings encouragement. Uh, if I ask you the question that Bob Goff asked his students, uh, what, what lights your bulb? What, what, what injustice keeps you awake at night? If, if there was an injustice that you could overturn, what would it be? If you could bring hope to one oppressed person or one segment of society, who would that be? These five programs on transformational leadership will attempt to provide encouragement, methodology, and strategy uh, to help equip you to pursue your burden. This transformational leadership, the overview, there, there will be an introduction uh, that we're discussing now about what is the challenge and the goal. But then there are three important components to how we can become effective transformational leaders. It begins with the living with a passion, but also living with excellence and leaving a legacy. The whole idea of living, living with passion is how do you discern your kingdom assignment? The idea of, of leading with excellence, we want, we'll be learning from some of the best practices that uh, studies on effective leadership from the business community uh, from around the world. What are the best practices that they've discovered that will help us to accomplish our goals and objectives? And, and then, but it's not enough. You can be passionate, you can lead with excellence, but unless we change unjust laws, unless we throw off the, those systems of oppression, unless we change the narrative about what truth is and what integrity is, then our work will have been done in vain. And so this third section that we will stu study is how can we leave a legacy? How can we implement uh, uh, practices and legislation that ensure the enduring uh, uh, effect of these social changes? Uh, one of the things that we'll do in this study is, is to study some individuals who have made a, a tremendous difference uh, in, in the world. Uh, one of those is William Wilberforce, and, and he was the one that led in the movement for the abolition of slavery in England uh, a little over 200 years ago. Another one was a Catholic nun, Mother Teresa, uh, in, in India, in Calcutta, India, her ministry was just to reach out to dying and sick and abandoned children and to love them so that at least they could die with dignity. Martin Luther King Jr. is one of my heroes, and he was one of the ones that, that drew attention to some unjust laws uh, in, in America that kept blacks uh, in, 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 in a, a very servant kind of position uh, to, to the white majorities. And yet he challenged those laws and by God's grace, uh, put together a team that really brought about systemic changes. Cory ten Boom was a wonderful woman. She and her family were, were living in the Netherlands. Uh, they were Christian family, and, and she led Bible studies so that, that children might come to know uh, the scripture that, that was most important to her. During that time, though, was the rise of Nazism and, and, and the beginning of World War II. The Jewish people became the target of these oppressors, and so Corrie ten Boone and her family welcomed these 
these, uh, uh, these people who were, who were being sought uh, to be put in prison, welcomed them to their home and, and she hid them. She even, they built a place on their house that was a private room where uh, these who were trying to escape the clutches of Nazism would be able to live safely. Sooner or later, though, they found out, the authorities found out what Cory Ten Boone and her family were doing. And, and she and her sister and her father were arrested. Her father died in prison. Uh, later, when, when Cory Ten Boone and her sister was in the prison, uh, the, the war camps, uh, along with many of the Jews and others who had been, uh, been uh, uh, captured by, by the, the, the German Nazis, uh, during that time, her sister even died. But finally, because of a mistake, a clerical mistake, Cory Ten Boone was able to be freed. She gave up her freedom and her life to help those who are oppressed. Transformational leaders, how can we be those who fight against injustice? The goal of this series is to introduce leaders and provide tools that will assist you to pursue a journey that will offer freedom to those who are shackled to ineffective and oppressive systems that imperil the vulnerable. Uh, Oz Guinness, a uh, British journalist who, who came to the United States, and he, he wrote the book A Free People's Suicide, and he said, freedom requires virtue, virtue requires faith, and faith requires freedom. Uh, this is the golden triangle. What is Guinness saying? He's saying, if you expect to have freedom, uh, freedom in a community, uh, freedom in a home, freedom in the workplace, or freedom in your nation, Freedom requires virtue. Just a democracy without, without virtue is, is something that would, could bring about chaos. You can't hire enough soldiers or hire enough policemen to make sure that people do the right thing. It has to be something that's within their heart so that people will choose to do what is right and what is good rather than that which is bad. Freedom requires virtue. Well, where does virtue come from? Virtue comes from faith. It, it's through our faith that God begins to work in us those principles of, 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 of righteousness and justice for others. This faith cannot be coerced by the state. It can't be coerced by a dominant religion. To have that kind of faith, it requires freedom. There must be freedom to choose and freedom to believe and freedom to share your beliefs with others. So freedom requires virtue, virtue requires faith, and faith requires freedom. Uh, 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 there was the historian and, 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 and writer uh, um, studying social systems, Alex de Tocqueville, who, who came from France to America in 1831. This was 40 years after the U.S. Constitution came into being. He, he couldn't understand. There was also a, a revolution in France, and, and it had not had the positive in, uh, outcomes that he was seeing taking place in America. And so he wondered, what made this American experiment work? Uh, what was it that caused the people there to to fight for justice for people of all faiths and all backgrounds. He came to the conclusion, and this is a statement that de Tocqueville wrote, not until I went into the churches of America and I heard her pulpits aflame with righteousness did I understand the secret of her genius and power. America is great because uh, America is good. If America ever ceases to be good, America will cease to be great. As an American, I'm praying that, that we will not be evil or, or selfish or greedy, as so often is the case for us, but that God would give us a heart of virtue, a heart of benevolence, a heart of compassion, a heart of love, so that we might be the country that I believe God intended for us to be. 
I mentioned that 200 years ago, slavery was not only something that was being, being experimented in England, but it was a part of the whole global economy. Uh, people all over the world considered slavery to be essential uh, for the economies of the world to work. And yet the people in England, very seldom did they see slaves. And, and so they believed the narrative that actually the slaves are better off. Uh, they were taken from villages in Africa and they were put on boats. And when they were on the boats, they had singing and dancing and, and good meals. They took them to America where they got jobs so they could live a better lifestyle than they had in Africa. Well, that was a lie. But the people wanted to believe the lie because they didn't want their lives disturbed. But then came the Zong incident, the Zong massacre. Uh, there was a slave ship that was named the Zong, and it sailed from Ghana on August the 18th, 1781, with 442 slaves on board. By the time they came to their destination, Black River, Jamaica, in 1781, December the 22nd, only 208 of those slaves had survived. Uh, some of them perished just because of the conditions of the ship, but 132 were drowned by unscrupulous sailors. What had happened as they were on this journey, rather than having good meals and singing and dancing, uh, they were stacked underneath the belly of the ship like, like uh, cordwood, uh, uh, just crammed together in, in unventilated uh, conditions and, and with heat. Some mothers were there with their children, and some even gave birth to children while they were on the journey. Uh, it was very difficult for them to even relieve themselves because, again, they were just lying flat on their backs or on their bellies in, in, in the heart of the ship. Uh, many had obviously had never been on a boat before, and, and they were nauseated, and they were sick and, and, and disturbed. And so all kinds of illnesses began to brew on the ship. But the sailors thinking that well, we're not going to make money uh, off the ship, off, off of this, these slaves, uh, if, if they don't survive. And so, but they thought, well, if we call it a, a natural incident and, and then we get rid of the slaves, then our insurance will pay for the slaves that we lost. And so these unscrupulous sailors brought these women and children and men up to the upper deck. They, they loosed their chains from them. Uh, they were probably excited to breathe in fresh air and, and with a hope of escape and, and, and new life. They had no idea that the sailors would throw them overboard to their, their, to their peril, their death, uh, just to be able to get uh, an, an adjustment on the owner's insurance. Well, back in England, there was a musician named Granville Sharp. When he heard about the murder of these slaves, he used this story of the Zong massacre to increase public awareness of the horrors of slavery. He wanted to make sure that the people in Britain no longer believed that slaves had it well, but it was a horrible injustice against people uh, throughout the world. This man, uh, Granville Sharp, was one of many who were able to overturn these unjust laws. It took him and Wilberforce and others their entire life to get this injustice overturned. If we're going to be effective leaders, we must be passionate, competent, and strategic. This series, Transformational Leadership, we use biblical, historical, contemporary, and personal examples of, of leaders who have brought about positive change within cultures of oppression that transcend their own time and place. For me, the primary example is Jesus. And we will look at his life. How did this man coming from a, 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 an obscure area of Galilee and Israel, how did his life, his death, and his resurrection bring about change uh, in the overthrow of the shackles of injustice. I want to ask you the question that Bob Goff asked that we discussed early on. What lights your bulb? What is the burden of your heart? What is your passion? What is the injustice that you want to spend your life fighting against? I pray that this series will provide some tools and some encouragement and some models so that you and I can make a difference for the world's most vulnerable. God bless you.